Good morning. I uh, wanted to start just trying to think of a joke to start off with. And, you know, we've had such uh, high Sabbaths lately with our international Sabbath and uh, last week with the youth Sabbath that uh, it really had to twist my arm to take the pulpit today. But uh, I didn't think it was a very good joke, so I didn't bother. For those who don't know, because I've been asked many times, it's a uh, rotator cuff surgery. Um, everything's good. Uh, it's a long process that's irritating. And this hand is always cold. But other than that, everything is going well. Thank you for your prayers. And if we could bow our heads one more time, please. Heavenly Father, we indeed all ask for that clean heart, Lord, that changed heart. Father, we ask for your spirit. We ask for your words, your thoughts. Please open our hearts, our ears. Father God, may we worship you. We thank you that you are here with us. We also pray that you be with our brothers and sisters who are in El Salvador. Those who aren't here because they are with family who are dealing with death. Those who are traveling, we pray for safety. But Father God, again, we pray for your words and for your message and for your heart. And we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Hezekiah. King Hezekiah. Again, no clever way to start. I wanted to talk about King Hezekiah today. And when you think of King Hezekiah, what do you think of? Now hopefully you're not sitting there right now going, who is Hezekiah? But if you are, I'll give you a quick summary. He was a king of Judah, and he was actually a very good king. Unfortunately, he's probably best known for some ambassadors come from Babylon to visit him, and when they come, instead of praising God, instead of show, telling them about the living God, he instead shows them all of his riches, he shows them his home the money that he has, his status. And that's pretty much the story of King Hezekiah. Now, if Jason was here, he'd say, that's great, that's a great sermon, let's go. But, of course, you know, it's me, so we're going to be here a little longer. The whole story of Hezekiah, it starts, we have to back up a little bit. We have to start in 2 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to read quite a few verses 2 Kings, chapter 17, verses 7 through 18. And it says, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against their, the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, I love how God starts this. I love how God starts to write this. He reminds Israel, he reminds us why he's worthy of, of worship. You know, uh, I have a little story about Alec. He was out with his aunt this past week, and, and they were at a store, and somebody had brought up that uh, they were going to get something for free, and Alec said, nothing in life is free. And I was so proud. <laughs> if there is a blue ribbon for parenting, I just want it right there. You know, we talk of uh, God's grace, and God's grace is free, amen? But even though it's free, there is something that goes along with it. There is something he wants from us, and that's gratitude. Nothing in life is free, because with that free gift, we do have to give something back. We have to give gratitude. God's love is free. 
You know, the New Testament calls it thanksgiving, right? To be thankful. By the way, gratitude is worship. That's what worship is. Goes on to say, and they, they had feared other gods. Now, Adventists, what's that word fear mean? We tell people all the time, right? When it says to fear God and give him glory, what does that mean? To give him respect, to reverence, right? But the Israelites at the time, they were fearing other gods. They were giving that respect to other gods. And they had walked in the statutes of the nations. Now again, I'm asking the question, what does that mean? To walk in the statutes of the nations that were around them. That means whatever popular doctrine of the time, that's what they were following. Whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, which they had made. Also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord, their God, things that were not right. Now again, God says, you're doing all these things against me, but I'm still the Lord, your God. They built themselves high places in all their cities from the watchtower to fortify the city. They set up themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places, like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them. Again, the author is pointing out, God's look, pointing out, look, I've destroyed these people for the exact same reasons, for the exact same thing that you guys are doing right now. I destroyed these people before. You have been separated from them to me. But you have turned away by blurring in these nations' religion with yours. And the crazy thing is, is that if the Israelites were asked, they would say, yes, we are the chosen people of God, all at the same time. They did wicked things to provoke the Lord's anger, for they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all of his prophets, yes, all of his prophets, God tries to turn his people back by his prophets, and yet they don't believe them. Because after all, you don't have to believe everything the prophet says, do you? Every, with every seer saying, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but instead stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimony, which he had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and went after the nations who were all around them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should do, not do like them. So they left all the commandments of God made for themselves molded images and two calves made of wooden images and worshiped all the host of heaven, again, mixing in the world's religion with God's religion and served Baal. Not so bad, right? But it does continue. And they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft, soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. You know, it reminds me when we, when we study the life of Christ when he's here on earth, often we ask ourselves, boy, how did they miss it, right? How did they miss that that was Jesus? How did they miss that he was the Christ? Well, especially when it comes to the leaders of the church, how did they miss it? Well, again, this is their background. You know, uh, how many of you have ever seen Aladdin? Remember the movie Aladdin? There's this guy named Jafar, and if my recollection is a little mixed up, forgive me, it was like 20 years ago, but there's this guy Jafar, and he's got the king's ear, right? But what is, do you guys remember what Jafar looked like? All dressed in black, and he had this evil, you know, face on all the time. 
and yet he had the king's ear. Now, obviously, if, if Jafar looked like that, or if the, if the Pharisees, I should say, looked like that, then people wouldn't listen to them, right? So they didn't look... I think we paint that picture sometimes when we go through the New Testament, when we look at Jesus' life, we paint that picture of the Pharisees. They were just angry and mad all the time. But that's not the case. The Pharisees had a, the outside anyway, they, they had all the right look to them. They said all the right things. They did all the right things, so to speak. Remember, they loved the best places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. So it wasn't that they, it wasn't like the people had to do this. They wanted to do this. The people came to them, generally speaking. The Pharisees were liked. On the surface, men of God. Again, the remnant had accepted so much of the world that Jesus looked more like the bad guy because he wasn't being very nice. And the Pharisees, actually, were the ones that looked nice. Try to imagine, if you can, being a remnant of people that follow a living God and being surrounded by a nation, people, kinder tongue that don't. I know it's pretty hard. Try to imagine that. Try to imagine living in a world that promotes sin. And understand what that means to promote sin. That doesn't just mean we let it go by. We actually encourage it. A world that encourages sin. A world that says sin is good, not the other way around. Lawlessness is good. Not only is sin good, but it's the overpowering influence that controls the law of the land. This is the nation that we walk with, and this is the nation that Israel walked with as well. The majority believe something that's contradictive to God. So let me simplify, because that's what I do. God is love. He claims that he's love. He's patient. He's kind. He's forgiving. And Satan says, you know, maybe God isn't that. So he starts to sow these seeds of doubt. And the great controversy that everybody deals with throughout history is faced with this. Do I believe what God says that he is, which is love, or do I doubt it? Now, not just I doubt the whole thing, but is there a part of it that I might doubt? And if one doubts the character of God, then who can you trust? Who can you trust if you can't trust God? Well, the only conclusion is, You can only trust yourself then. Only you can decide what is good and evil. And again, we teach that Satan wants to be worshipped, and that part is true. And and there is a a minority of goofballs that claim to do that. And as goofy as an idea as that is, and I can say that because I know some, (laughs) and they're goofy. But as, as goofy as that idea is, we tend to fall for it too. We tend to think as long as we're not that bad, then I'm good. I'm okay. As long as I'm not bowing down to idols like those those foolish people in the Old Testament, as long as I'm being good, I'm okay. Satan worship is not believing all that he says. It is feeding that doubt that he put there, and therefore you can trust yourself and yourself only. He wants worship because he sets you free from that God, not because he deserves it necessarily. He does think he does. but And you can be a really nice person, for the most part, and have super nice ideas while walking farther and farther away from God. I say you can be nice for the most part because self-worship has a flaw. Self-worship has a flaw in its pride. If something goes against our pride, we're not so nice anymore. And if God bruises our pride, well, that's not a problem. We can just change who God is. We can decide who, what is good and what is evil. We can have a false image of God. 
And in this world that we live in, this world of confusion that we live in, we can find really good company with these seeds of doubt. In a world, again, that calls bad good and vice versa. You know, most of the time we're not asked to deny God. Most of the time we're not asked that. What we are asked to do is stop making such a big deal about things, right? Stop being so rigid. Are you really that uptight? Can't you just bend a little bit? You know, I find in this world that uh, Christians are the only ones apologizing for who they are and what they believe. Nobody else apologizes like we do. If you talk to people, you hear a lot of, trying to be nice, uh, bad theology. How about we just say it that way? You hear a lot of bad theology, right? People that live their lives according to this theology, and as they're telling you, you you can just see the train wreck, right? And yet that's what they believe. And for us, it's, it's ludicrous to us. And yet, if you say you have truth and that there is a living God, well, you're the weirdo, right? Do you know it's more acceptable today to believe that we come from aliens than it is to believe in a living God? It is more acceptable to believe that. L. Ron Hubbard would be very proud. This is the state of the world that we live in. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. This is the same world that King Hezekiah comes from. It is a world of confusion. The world he grew up in is the, is the same in his day. So if we go from that spot, if we go from this is where King Hezekiah grew up to the next spot where these uh, ambassadors come from Babylon and, and, and they want to they wanna talk to Hezekiah and all he does is show them his treasures... One could argue, so what's the big deal? He was raised in a messed up world. It wasn't his fault, right? He inherited a messed up Israel. For some, and he inherited it from some other messed up king. He was just another bad politician that showed off a little. But that's not the case, again, with Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. He was a godly man. Yes, he came out of a bad world, but he turned, his, he turned back to God. Amen? He did all he could to restore Israel during his reign, Judah. He broke down the pillars, the wooden images. We read in 2 Kings 18, uh, 5 through 7, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. Hezekiah walked with God. He kept his commandments. He trusted in the Lord God. We also read, because of this relationship that he has, he's not just blessed. But Judah is blessed, and most of Israel starts to turn back to God. And for the sake of time, later on we'll also read that Hezekiah's life gets extended. He uh, he gets a life-ending disease, and he, he prays for an extension, and God gives him an extra 15 years of life. All that Hezekiah has is truly because of the living God. But again, nothing, is, nothing in life is free. You know, there is a reason God asks us to keep the commandments. It really is the most logical, consistent relationship we can have to walk constantly, continuously in all that we do with him. Because otherwise, the flip side of that coin is, our relationship with God is, hey God, I sinned again, do you forgive me? Yes, I do. Okay, cool, I'll see you later when I sin again and need your forgiveness again. Because you have to do it after all the Bible says so. 
That sounds a lot like self-worship, does it not? I'll play the forgiveness card when it's good for me. I'm still a good person. I still believe. So we need more than belief. And also, we see here with Hezekiah that he loved the commandments of God. Through Christ, through, he, he did those commandments, just as we can. But there's a third part. There's a third part that's missing. And like Hezekiah, there's this, there's this part of our relationship with God that at times a lot of us fall short of, I believe. I do. I'm just as guilty. Psalms 100 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Now, no doubt you have sung, sang, sung the Lord's praises today. Yes, you have. You have praised and you have worshiped today. But does this psalm say, serve the Lord with gladness? On the Sabbath only? Do we sing our praises on Sunday? Sunday, the true Advent is day of worship. Not worship, of rest, right? Don't mess with our Sundays. That's our that's our real, you know, Sabbath, we are we're busy, we're here. Don't mess with our Sundays. That's the only kind of kidding. Do we do do we sing his praises on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with our co-workers? On 94. (laughs) Some of you are laughing out loud. Are we practicing what Deuteronomy 6 tells us? All these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Paul simply puts it this way. Rejoice in the Lord God always. And again I say, rejoice. I'll just ask you plainly, like God asks me, by the way, are we worshiping all the time? Or only when it's a proper place or a proper time? That not rejoicing all the time, this is what Hezekiah fell trapped to. When the representatives of Babylon come to, come to him, come to speak with him, instead of rejoicing in God, he shows them his money, he shows them his house, he shows them his status. He's very hospitable. He sounds very nice. I mean, he opens his house. He gives all that he has. You know, Babylon came with a purpose that day. There was a reason Babylon was there, those those ambassadors of Babylon. They wanted to see what made Hezekiah different. Again, with all these other bad kings that they had seen in the past, Hezekiah prospered. They wanted to see what was different. Again, um, Hezekiah's health was, was, was granted him, an extra 15 years, and, and uh, Hezekiah wanted a sign from God to, to uh, let him know that God heard him. And so God actually turned time backwards for him. The Babylonians noticed this. You can't turn time backwards without it being noticed. The Babylonians noticed this. That is why they were there. They came, they wanted to see for themselves what made Hezekiah different, and he didn't do it. He did all the nice things. He, showed, he, he opened his home to them, but he did not speak to them about the living God. He did not praise him. He did not glorify him. And just like that, how quickly 
he got into this dangerous area of self-worship. Look at all that I have. He doesn't deny God. He just doesn't bring him up. Which in turn puts you front and center. This is the ripple effect that he, if he doesn't point out God, the ripple effect is this, which means he does not point out the turning back of his people because of the rebuilding efforts of the sanctuary. He does not speak of the warning that comes from the prophets of the time. And he does not speak of the life extension promised by God. Oh, Adventists, this should sound very familiar. When Babylon comes, does he tell them of the loving God, the everlasting gospel? He does not. Does he tell them to fear God, give him glory, and worship him? Nope. Does he tell Babylon, come out of Babylon? He doesn't do that. He replaces his message. He replaces that message from God, and he says, hey, Babylon, you know what? We're not that different. There's no need to praise God here because, look, it's not the Sabbath. I'm not a fanatic. I don't need to do this right now, but I'll be nice. It was more important to show that he was a nice guy And he takes God completely out of the picture. He didn't stop believing. He'll probably still be at the synagogue the next following Sabbath. He just didn't praise God because it just wasn't the place or time. You know, humanity has a problem. We all have it, I think. We want to be so cool, don't we? We all want to be cool. The Bible calls it vanity, but I don't like that word because uh, I think when we think of vanity, you know, we think of somebody holding a mirror and, you know, combing their hair if they had any and, and just, you know, really loving themselves, right? I think that's what we see vanity as. But really, vanity cannot, and there are those extremes, don't get me wrong, but I think we like to talk in extremes because when we talk in extremes, it leaves us out of it. Because most of us don't consider ourselves in those extreme categories. So we're safe in the middle. But here's the, but here's the real issue. Humanity has a problem wanting to be cool, for a lack of a better way of putting it. Think back to high school. If you think I'm wrong, think back to high school, junior high. No place, humans shouldn't have to go through that. And if you weren't one of the popular kids in high school, you couldn't wait to get out. Oh, I can't wait to leave all of this behind, right? And then you go to college or whatever's next, and you're like, oh, it's happened again, right? There's cliques, there's uh, fraternities and, and, and sororities and all those things, right? And you're like, well, at least once I get out of here and I'll be an adult finally, I'll go to work and I won't have to deal with this because... You know, that doesn't happen in your workplace, right? You go to work and you see adults still acting like high school kids, and it's, it's ridiculous. We have this problem. We want, it's a tribe mentality that we have. We want so hard to be cool. And then you have Christians. And now we just start off uncool, according to the world. And by the way, I don't think there's a whole lot to change that. The world just doesn't like the foundation that you have. But we try so hard. I use this analogy all the time. We're like, we're like a nerd that gets invited to prom by the, by the cheerleader, and we'll do anything to keep that date. In the meantime, it's a hoax. We've all seen John Hughes movies. And then, then there's Adventist. We can't even be cool with all the nerdy other Christians. We're on a whole other level of nerd. Trying to be cool, which is so embarrassing. I got to tell you, if I hear of another person that tells me that they, they chose the church that they're in right now because they got to wear jeans to their church and you can, sell, and you can buy coffee out in the uh, vestibule, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> I hear it all the time. Ooh, how cool. You get to wear jeans. 
Ooh, you rebel. And I always get in trouble when I say this. I'm not saying if you wear jeans to church, you're doing something bad. But if you pick your church because you get to wear jeans there, that's the problem I have. And again, then there's us. We don't even go on the right day. And yet we try so hard. Come on, like me. Please like me. Be my friend, please. And you guys might think you don't do this, but we kind of do. We kind of do. And in the process, what we do is we sell ourselves out. We, we sell ourselves out to try to tell Babylon how cool we are. Again, we're the ones apologizing. We're the ones that we have a solid foundation and we're apologizing for it. We're the ones that are, are trying to prove we're not so rigid, we're not so judgmental, that we can bend a little bit. We can accept the world's politics to transform our identity instead of the other way around. It's more important to us right now to be on the right side of history than on the right side of judgment. You know, every time that we're not praising God, what we're doing instead is we're just filling a void that the world fills for us. But hey, at least we're cool, right? You know, as our priorities as a church seem to be changing to satisfy a world that won't accept us anyway, as we show Babylon how cool we are, our church is definitely changing. You know, I have some statistics. They're kind of current. They're from 2014. But you know what, before I do that, I've been up here for a while. It's kind of warm. The sun's coming in on my head over here. Let me read these statistics to you, though. You know, 92% of Adventists, this is polls from Adventism, 92%, I'll start with the good news, believe that the Sabbath is the right day of worship. Now, you might think, you know, as a C average student, 92 is pretty cool. Cool, I use that word again, sorry. Uh, but that means 8% of Seventh-day Adventists don't believe that the seventh day is the Sabbath. 93% believe that God created the world. That means 7% of Adventists do not believe that. 88% believe that we're the remnant. 79% believe in our state of the dead. That's getting kind of low, 79%. That's C. Those are, those are my grades in high school. This one makes no sense to me because we have 92% that believe that Sabbath is the correct day, but only 74% believe in a literal creation week. These are Adventist. 60%, we're getting close to half 60% believe our teaching of the sanctuary. 60% believe that Ellen White is a prophet. We're getting to half Adventists. Question wasn't even asked how important the three angels' message is. Question wasn't even asked. Out of every hundred that come into the church, 40 leave. And what's interesting about that number is that when asked later on in the same poll why they left, there was no big reason. There wasn't this big answer, you know, there wasn't, yes, there was little slivers of the pie that said, you know, because people were mean to me or, you know, very slim piece of doctrinal. The biggest piece, three quarters of the pie, was I just drifted away. I just left. There wasn't any real big thing, just left perhaps went on a stroll with the nations. And probably the most telling statistic that we have here today, more of you are upset about the hat that I just put on my head than the statistics I just read. Now be honest with yourself. Did that get your heart pumping when I put that on? Positive or negative? 
Did that get your heart pumping? Now, what about those statistics? How bad did that hurt? Sons of Adam, where are you? Who are you walking with? Are you walking with God or are you walking with the surrounding nations? By the way, I hope you're hearing my message. I hope you're not upset or trying to figure out, oh, was that his hat? Did he borrow it? Is he for it? I hope you're not doing that. I hope you understand the analogy. And I'm also going to ask the AV team, you know, guys, when you guys post that picture on YouTube, if it could be without the hat instead of with the hat, because I don't need that kind of negativity in my life. Have my hand up like that as I'm talking. Uh, just one arm, though. In conclusion, Hezekiah's story is so interesting because he didn't stop believing. He didn't deny God. He just didn't think it was important when he was around the unremnant, if you will. He didn't think it was important to praise him. He didn't think it was important to put God first at that time. And again, that's what they were looking for. That's the shame of it. They came there looking for the living God. Why did you receive this extension of life? Why did God turn back time for you? And again, instead of showing them who the living God is, he just takes the opportunity to show them nothing. Ultimately, it was nothing. But hey, they were still cool. I say nothing because guess what? It doesn't, work out for ba- it doesn't work out for Hezekiah and it doesn't work out for us either. Years later, Babylon comes back. Babylon comes back and, and why not after all? Because there's nothing to fear there. And guess what they took? They took the gold, they took the silver, they took the status, they literally took all of Judah. They came back for what they were shown. They didn't come back for the living God, because he was never shown. Hezekiah had a purpose, and he didn't fulfill it. Bending a little bit that day, Hezekiah brought destruction to generations later. Our responsibility to each other is that severe. What Hezekiah doesn't show, Judah reaps later. Dear church, my plea today, stop letting the world transform our priorities. You know, the true remnant of God never changes its priorities. The true remnant of God points back to a living God. Always. They always point back. A true prophet, a true prophetic message isn't, hey, this is what the future is, although there is some of that. But most of the prophets in Scripture, they pointed back to God, to the true worship of God. They pointed backwards more than they pointed forwards. Stop selling out because we want to be cool. Religion is more than being nice. Guys, it's, it's one of those things that we hear all the time from the world. I don't need a church to tell me to be nice. You're right. We don't. The world is as messed up as it is. People can be nice when it's convenient for them, right? Religion is more than being nice. Actually live that. Compromising to get along has worked zero times. It only makes us weak. Praise God always. Always have God first. That's true worship, not just on Sabbath. Romans 12.2 says it best. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. May that be our message. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is always nerve-wracking 
to take the pulpit and have a, a message like this. Because as I preach these words, as I preach this message, Father, I know the eyeballs are staring back. Lord, I need this message. Lord, may we stand for you, not because we want to be abrasive, not because we want to be fanatical, but because it's just who we are, we worship the living God. And we should not apologize for that. Father, as we live in this world of confusion, may we be that beacon of light, of truth, stability, the things that people are looking for. Father God, thank you for your message. May we not hide it. May that great pearl shine before us. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.